Well, here we are, back again. As you can see, my good friend from France, Odon Lafontaine. We've been friends for a few weeks now, and Odon's going to do something a little bit different than what he did before. Most of you know that we no longer trust the 9th and 10th century traditions. We've thrown them away. The standard Islamic narrative, we're not going to anymore. And we're moving back over here to the 7th century when it supposedly all happened. If it happened here, then we should be able to see it. We should be able to look at it. We should be able to find all kinds of artifacts and enormous amount of material that exposes and gives us names, dates, places of the events that the traditions talk about, but we just can't. Now, what you, we have been doing in this team with Murad and with Mel and with Joe and with Paul is to look at all the artifacts back here and try to piece together what did exist trying to piece it together so we can make sense of it. We wish the Muslims would have done that, but they did it. So we're going to now come to a smoking Odin over here as he's puffing on his pipe. And we've asked him to look at another category, a whole new category. In fact, he is going to look at this book here. He's going to use this book to help understand what really happened, but also to show that the standard Islamic narrative has been imposing on this book. Now, which one do you have there that you're holding up? Uh, it's Droge. Droge. Okay, uh, you like the Droge's one? Very that's good translation. One, that's the one you should use. This is the one Muslims demand you use. You notice this is the small one, the little one. I always keep this one smaller than my Bible because it's absolutely hopeless. It's the worst translation. This is the Helali and Khan translation. But because when I engage with Muslims, this is the only one they'll let me use. That's why I hold it up. And you can see it's getting smaller and smaller as we go along. Take a look at all these here. You can see why. You notice I'm wearing my brown shirt. When I heard that Odon was going to be using the Quran to help understand what really happened and also to show how hopeless the traditions are, because the traditions were created to unpack the Quran. But what they didn't know and what they didn't realize is you've got to unpack what happened in the seventh century, because even the Quran... If it is from the 7th century, and Odin and I do not agree on that, if it is from the 7th century, then it should give us an awful lot of areas that we can look at. So that's what he's going to do. And that's what, Odin, you've been working on this for years, haven't you? Uh, yes, yes, but I'm merely the, the speaker of scholars who worked <laughs> tens of years on the subject. Oh, that's all of us. We're all that. None of us have done this germinal research ourselves. We are their mouthpiece. We are the exactly, ones that are the mouthpiece. Take, we're taking Especially what they're for, saying. I, I speak for Edouard Marie Galez, who, who made a, a tremendous thesis. He published it in 2005. And um, he, he really made a, a groundbreaking discovery uh, using the Quran as a uh, a source material, uh, because um, lots, uh, um, a big part of the Quran uh, actually uh, comes from the seventh century. Of course, it has been edited, it has been a bit changed, corrected, but some of it undoubtedly uh, dates from the seventh century. Oh, don't and stop there. It goes back to the third, the fourth century. We have parts of the Quran. And even before, and even before. I mean, we and even have before. parts of the Quran that go back to 1400 BC. So because so much of it is borrowed from many different sources, you will find. And so when he's saying much, the Quran comes from the seventh century, he's not necessarily talking about this book in uh, what 114 surahs as we see it here. So just be, so people don't get upset and say, wait, 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 how, how can he say that? How can he prove that? I'm just going to obviate that, that problem. He's not saying that. What he is saying is the material in the Quran, the book, many of the, much of the poetry, many uh, come from, Christian and Christian lectionaries and also Christian hymns. Uh, they were put together in the fifth, sixth century. Some of it even goes back to the fourth century. So that, that we understand. But you're also saying that you believe that somebody put this book together at Tulsa in the, in the seventh century. The process started in the seventh century. Okay. We don't really know <laughs> when it ended. Maybe it ended. Maybe it ended in <laughs> 1924 with the Cairo edition, but the no, process that was the kid out. That was the kid out. That's a different discussion. But as far as the manuscripts are concerned, I think most scholars, and I would agree with them, would say around the 10th century. 
It could even yes, be yes. as early as but the. You see, you see, different. one thing, one thing is the manuscript, and another thing is the meaning. Ah, okay. And well, that's nowadays, whole... nowadays, nowadays, Muslims still keep on invent, inventing new meanings. But let's go back and let's give it to you. I'm going to give you now. Help us here. Use the Quran to unpack and help us understand what was really happening, because the Quran is a window to that, is it not? I think so. I think so. It, it is a great help um, with Mel, with Joe, with with Paul, and with all the scholars. We, we have seen a lot of new material, and I think with the Quran, we we, we can make make all of this fit. Yeah. In, um, in in a, in, a, in a scheme, you know, a pattern, okay, a, a grand pattern that will explain us what happened during the seventh century, and you will see that all the the pieces will fit together. Okay, so now, we might is... have our differences with Mel, Joe, Murad, and, and other scholars also, but the the, the 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 key point here is to to look at the pattern, and this this is what I'm. Um, what I will try to, to present now. Okay, over to you. And we're going to just do a quick overview at this point. We will unpack more of it, bits and pieces of it as we go on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. So um, at first, I, I wanted to just have a, a very, very quick look at the standard Islamic narrative, because it has always been for most people who took an interest in Islamic origin, a sort of starting point. The standard Islamic narrative is all about a prophet who revealed the Quran to ignorant pagans. Thus, a whole new re religion developed, a religion pretending to be the uh, sort of return to a primordial religion, which uh, return corrected the Jewish and Christian deviances of this primordial re religion. And, and then it paved the way for the Arab conquest and the rise of the Caliphal Empire. This is more or less the standard Islamic narrative, but we will see that this standard Islamic narrative and the Islamic reading of the Quran are being seriously challenged nowadays by the, the new studies. But at first there is the obvious, which needs to be stated. The standard Islamic narrative has imposed a sort of um, preconceived idea about Islam, about its origin, and uh, especially that imposed um, an Islamic reading, reading of the Quran. Without even knowing it, we are kind of forced into an interpretation uh, which abides by the standard Islamic narrative with concepts such as a unique prophet, uh, who uttered God's word, or pretended to utter God's word, uh, which was formed into a book. God's words was a book. The revelation was a book. This book, of course, is the Quran, which is man mentioned in the Quranic text. Uh, it happened in the Hijaz area in Arabia. It was a pagan av av environment. The Arabs uh, were pagans, polytheists at this time. Uh, it happened uh, at the beginning of the 7th century, uh, around Mecca and Medina. There was an ancient shrine, Abrahamic shrine, shrine in, in, in Mecca, and also an ancient pilgrimage. Those are the, um, the concepts um, by which we think Islam, and we think, it's, uh, we think Islam's origin. Um, but in order to to think Islam, really, we, we have to start from scratch. This is what the um, revisionist school of the 70s, John Wansbro, Patricia Krohn, Michael Cook, um, made clear. We have to start from scratch. We have to start by looking at the sources, at, at, at what we know really existed at the time of the origins, and not um, relying on narrative that were written uh, during the 9th, 10th, 11th century, and even after. So, um, <clears throat> as we keep on setting the obvious, obvious about Islamic narrative, 
Um, and this is why we have to start from scratch. We see that the, the standard Islamic narrative does not make sense in many ways. There are many contradictions, many discrepancies, um, many things that are very odd in terms of logic, uh, simple logic, history, geography. Um, I've put some here. Of course, <laughs> it's only a, a selection, but uh, one could ask, why is there no mention, or no mention at all, or um, maybe one or two, but if quasi no mention of the key role of the Arabs in the major events of the seventh century? You see, Jay, uh, you know that in the seventh century, the Arabs were not only in Arabia. They were kind of everywhere in the Middle East. Um, here is a map <clears throat> which I have taken from uh, Dan Gibson's Quranic Geography. Um, those are the main trade routes of the Nabataean Arab, uh, Arabs. And we see that um, before the seventh centuries, those routes were everywhere in the Middle East along the, the main Silk Road and the Arabs, um, the nomadic Arabs uh, dwelled on those, uh, on those routes. So they were in Damascus, they were in Palmyra, they were in Babylon, they were in Yemen, of course, they were in Petra, they were in Palestine, they were in Egypt, there were Arabs um, everywhere, everywhere. There were nomadic Arabs, and there were also um, settled, uh, sedentary Arabs. Uh, or the Arabs were not all uh, Bedouins, of course. There were Arabs living in the city. And um, the Arabs at this time, at the seven, during the seventh century, they were at the very center of the, um, the struggling between the two main superpowers of the, of the time, the Persian Empire and the Byzantium Empire. We see that the dwellings of the Arabs, they were exactly on the, on the frontier between the empires. And the empires played the Arabs, every empire playing um, his allies, his Arab auxiliaries against its, its, its opponents. For example, in Yemen here, uh, in the fifth century, there was um, a Christian kingdom allied to Axum, Ethiopia, and the, the Persian, they helped the Yemenites, the Arab Yemenites to um, push back to, um, this, Christian, um, this Christian kingdom and establish a Jewish kingdom against it was a move against Byzantium because Byzant Byzantium was allied with Ethiopia. And so Persia played the Arabs against Byzantium. Whereas in Byzantium, as had its, had its allies, the Ghassanid tribes in the east of the Syria, uh, west, uh, east of Syria, for example. And they, they were kind of um, in between um, the empires. And it, it has been the, um, like this in centuries, tens of centuries. The Romans had their um, uh, Arab auxiliaries against the Sassanids, against the, the Persians. And, 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 and it kept on going like this for centuries and centuries. At the beginning of the seventh centuries, the war between Byzantium and Persia came back. And once again, um, the Arabs were um, implicated um, waging war for Byzantium, for Persia, against one another, because they were at the center, at the epicenter of the, um, the game of influence, the game of war between the, the two main superpowers. So it's very strange that in the um, standard Islamic narrative, we have no indication, no mention of the key role of the Arabs during, during those events. The, another thing which is very, very strange, it is that we have now found, thanks to uh, um, people like um, Julien Christian Robin and may, many other archaeologists, we have now found that there is absolutely no trace of any active Arab paganism in the seventh century. Active, 
active cults. There may, might have been um, relics and, um, and, and, and old stuff, but there was no active cult at this time because the, um, the um, Arabs were mostly Christianized at the time. You will see this. Another thing is that the um, Mecca, the actual, uh, the current Mecca, uh, does not fit the standard Islamic description. This has been um, point, pointed out by uh, Patricia Cron, who pointed the obvious that Mecca is, is in uh, the, uh, the current Mecca is in a desert, and nothing grows in Mecca. But the um, standard Islamic narrative places certain events that we find in the Quran in the Meccan site. And so we are supposed to believe that the Quran describes the Meccan as being, as the Meccans, as being farmers who, are, who cultivate pomegranates, uh, vines, uh, wheat, olive trees, date palms, and they have camels, goats, goats, and they are also fishermen. They fish, uh, fish and shells in salt water and also in freshwater seas. And there are no freshwater seas in the Middle East apart from Syria and um, current Israel. So there is something very, very odd here. The standard Islamic narrative does not fit the, act, the current Meccan site. Uh, also- uh, Can I just jump in real quickly? Mm -hmm. this is, and you will get a kickback. And so Muslims have done this with me and you'll, I'm sure you've had it as well, those who are listening. Muslims will say, well, look at Saudi Arabia today. It has olive trees. What do you say? Mm -hmm. What do you mean it doesn't have any olive tree? And you look at Mecca today, it has buildings. There's all kinds of enormous, oh. you, can, you showed the, the clock tower, the fourth highest building in the world. So what do you mean that, that there is no civilization there? There are no big cities there. In the 21st century, yes, because of oil wealth, because of Saudi Arabian oil wealth. It has created all of this in our lifetime, in yours and my, Oda. And this is what most people don't realize. Don't look mm -hmm. at modern Saudi Arabia and the, yes, sir, you have olive trees in modern Saudi Arabia, but in the 7th century, this was just nothing more than a hamlet. There were very many people living here at all. This was known this, as... This could not have been a big city. It's not possible. Everything has to be brought from the outside. The there's food, no the food water, for the animals. No water, there's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, exactly. there are no people. And that's why this, no, this viewpoint that because they're there today, they must have been there way back in the 7th century. Absolutely but not. There was nothing there. It, what, what has changed, what has changed, um, it is um, the worst of the Arabs. One needs a, an empire, a very big, st a big state to um, provide for Mecca. Yeah. Without the state, and there was no such state, no such empire in the seventh century. Yeah. No, no city could have survived in the Meccan desert. Yeah. And would not survive today without everything being brought in. It has all has to be brought in. It's an artificial <laughs> city. Exactly, exactly. Also, uh, on your channel, Jay, you had Mel, uh, Paul, uh, Joe, talking about uh, Jerusalem and Mecca. Yeah. And uh, the thing about um, the Quran uh, describing Jerusalem and not Mecca. Uh, one thing that is very, very strange in the standard Islamic narrative is the issue of the place of Abraham. Makam Ibrahim, the place where Abraham stood, he stood before God as if in judgment, because in a sense, there are two places of Abraham in the standard Islamic narrative. There is, of course, the traditional uh, Meccan <laughs> uh, place of Abraham, but also the standard Islamic narrative kind of gives credit to Jerusalem being a legit place of Abraham. Because in Jerusalem, according to the standard Islamic narrative, there is the temple of Jerusalem. We find in the Quran that Zakaria visited Maryam in the sanctuary, Mihab, which designates the temple of Jerusalem. 
we also know that thanks to the Quran that Moses led the, um, the people to Jerusalem, in fact, to the place of Abraham. And so why, why did those um, Islamic prophets such as Moses, such as Zakaria, and also Jesus who was teaching in the temple, why were they in Jerusalem if Jerusalem was not the place of Abraham? Why did Moses took the, the, why did Moses take the people into Canaan, into Israel, into Jerusalem, and not into Mecca at this, at this time? You see here, there is something that doesn't work in the standard Islamic narrative. Um, and this needs to be, to be pointed out. Also, we, we see in the standard Islamic narrative that the Christians are called Nazarenes, Nasara, and they are not called by their real name, Masiyun. Masiyun, Masi, is the real name that the Arab Christian uh, used for themselves way before Islam. And we know this because the Christianization of the Arabs has been very well documented. Uh, it started at the first centuries, uh, even the first century. Uh, we can see in the, the act of the apostles that um, Arabs were, were there at the, at the Pentecost. And the um, Christian tradition tells us uh, to tell us about um, the apostles Matthias and Shimon, who respectively evangelized Jordan and Arabia. We found many, many, many inscriptions, Christian inscriptions in Arabia, thanks to archaeologists such as uh, Julien Christian Robin. Here's a photo of an inscription, Christian inscription in Hima, north of Najran, from the fifth century, a Christian inscription. And we have many sources telling us how the Arabs were Christianized. For example, by uh, Saint Timius the Great in the fifth century, who baptized, um, who baptized an, an, an Arab leader, um, Peter Asbebetos. Uh, and this Arab leader became, um, became the, a bishop, the bishop of the Arabs, and he was at the Council of Ephesus in the fifth century. So this is well documented. And even more, we know that at the end of the sixth century, the king, the, the Persian made a sort of king of all Arabs. His name was Al-Numan III, Ibn al-Mundir. He was according to the Chronicle of Set, the king of all the Arabs of the empires of Persia and Byzantium, and he was baptized. Hence, we understand that every Arab under his rule was baptized too. This was um, the way, this was the, the this, those were the, the customs of these times. And, and so in? the- Hold on. Everything mm -hmm. you're pointing out here, you're talking about Himma. Najran, that's in Yemen, that's in the south. You're talking about the mm -hmm. Lakhbij, you're talking about the Ghassanids. That's way in the north. You're not talking about anything in the middle part. Have you noticed that? All these exactly. Arabs, go back to that exactly. map, you'll see these Arabs are all way up in the north where the Ghassanids and the Lakhbij, see where they are? That is where Jordan is. The Lakhbij is where Iraq is. And then Himya, exactly. Himya is way down in Yemen. What about the Hijab? Himya, Yemen, okay. And in the middle, we have kind of the big nowhere the Hijaz, where there is no sign of Christian activity, but or there is no Jewish, sign of pagan activity, or there Jewish is no or sign anything. of activity. There is no um, sign of anything down there. There are no civilizations exactly. in the middle part. Interesting, all the- In, in the, um, in the, the western the middle part, western middle part, because in Kinda, Kinda, we find traces of um, uh, ancient Christianism. But Odon, where in Kinda, where? Uh, I've got a book here. <laughs> it's, on the Persian Gulf. it's on the coastal areas. Yes, of course. But hey, uh, the, what, what do you want? What do you want? Um, this is why people what want, do want to marry you. Not, nothing lives in the desert. <laughs> but can you see, you've got to make this point really, really clear. Because today, today, Riyadh is right in the middle of Kinda. Riyadh is the capital of Saudi Arabia. And people think mm -hmm. Riyadh is there. Every That's where the Arabs lived. And they would say also that Jeddah. Jeddah is right next to Mecca, and Jeddah is a huge city. 
And they're they're yeah. saying, therefore, there were people living here. This is why the standard Islamic narrative is correct. But what's interesting is everything you've just pointed to in the last 10 minutes is either way up in the north or way down in the south, but nothing in between. Even when you talked about Kinda, that's off near the coast, the eastern coast. It's not mm -hmm. inland, and it's nowhere near Mecca or Medina. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, let me go back. So there is something very strange, nonetheless. The Quran does not talk about Christians as Masi, which is their real name. There is only one occurrence of the Christians um, being named people of the gospel. Otherwise, they are called Nasara. But Nasara, Nazarene, is not the name of Christians. It used to be the name of the first Judeo-Christians in the first centuries, in the first century. But the, um, the Christian uh, kind of ditched this, this name and, um, and they named themselves uh, Mashiun, Mashiun in Aramaic, people of the Messiah. And Masi, which is exactly the same in Arabic, people of the of Al Masi, of Jesus. Um, another very strange thing about those Nazarenes, they are supposed to be Christian according to the standard Islamic narrative, but in the Quran, they are described as being the allies of the Jews in the seventh century, which could not have been possible in the seventh centuries. Christian and Jews were arch enemies. Uh, there have been the, there was a, there were some tragic events, um, an uprising of the Jews um, in in the Byzantine Empire, the taking of Jerusalem by an, ally, an, ally, an alliance of Persian and Jews, also with the help of um, some Arabs, and the Jews took um, took over Jerusalem. They assumed power there. And there were many persecutions against uh, the Christian. And before end, the Jews were expelled by the Romans in the second century from, from the land. And they were not allowed to come back to Jerusalem. So there was um, a strong enmity between Jews and Christian. And they could definitely not be called allies in the seventh century. So something also here is very wrong in the standard Islamic narrative. Another contradiction in the Quran, according to the standard Islamic narrative, also about the Nazarenes, is that they are described as being the closest to the believers and also as being the enemies of the believers. And this is very strange. And you see that in most, most translation of the Quran, um, the translator, kind of hides this contradiction. Uh, it's a contradiction between the verse um, in Surah 5, 51 and 82. We will uh, look, at, look at them in, in detail thereafter. And um, lastly, as, as uh, the last of the contradiction I, I want to, to, to point out here is the, uh, it, it is <laughs> what, what, uh, um, what you hinted at, there is no trace of Christianity in the Hijaz, but in the standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad's wife, Khadija, is supposed to be a Nazarene or a mixed, uh, mixed Nazarene, half Nazarene, half, half Arab, we don't really know. Um, but uh, her cousin, uh, Waraka bin Naufal, is, is a Nazarene. He's supposed to be a Christian living in a place where there is absolutely no trace of Christianity. And he's also being described as a former Jew who converted to Christianism. So it is very strange. The thing also, and we will uh, look at it in data, in detail thereafter, if Khadija's cousin was a Nazarene, and if Khadija was a Nazarene herself, doesn't it mean that all the in-laws of Muhammad were Nazarenes? Mm -hmm. Jewish, former Jewish. You see, we start to unveil, to uncover something. And this is what I want to, 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 <clears throat> to, to see here. New discoveries that tells us 
about um, the particular influence of a group being described as a Jewish group at the origins of Islam. You see, I've told you about already about the, um, the taking of Jerusalem in 614 by an alliance of Persian and Babylonian Jews. And they did it so with the help of Arab allies and auxiliaries in order, and there was an attempt to rebuild the temple at this time. This is the first crew. There is also, there are also sources, early, very early sources from the seventh century. A source, for example, that tells us that a prophet appeared with the Saracen. This source, you know, you know it, Jay, it's the Doctrina Jacobi. Yeah. Um, it's a propaganda uh, document. It's not, an, um, um, it's not it's, it was not written by an historian, but we can make something of it. Um, it's a propaganda document uh, criticizing the Jews. And it, it, um, it features a dialogue between two Jews and they're asking themselves about the prophet who has appeared with the Saracen. What can you tell me about the prophet who has appeared with the Saracen? So for the, those Jews, he's a false prophet. And, but this is not the issue here. The issue is that we have two Jewish people asking about a prophet. They are not asking about a Muslim prophet, a prophet of Islam. Of course, they're asking about a Jewish prophet. Mm -hmm. So a man of Jewish extraction, or at, at least half Jewish, or some, something of, must have some Jewish blood to pretend to be a, a Jewish prophet. And also, what prophet, what, what is the prophet that the, the Jews are waiting for? They are waiting for the prophet that will, that will be the precursor of the Messiah. The prophet that will tell them the Messiah is about to come, which for us Christians is John the Baptist. Right. So also other sources uh, that tell us that the Jews called the Arabs to their head. This is in the pseudo Sibios, an anonymous text from the seventh century who tells us about the story of Jews who were expelled from Edessa and the Jews called the Arabs to the head and familiarized them with the relationship they had through the books of the Old Testament. And here we have uh, the mention of um, MHMD Muhammad in that period, a certain one of them, Arabs then. So you see in the Doctrine of Jacobi, he was a potential candidate for the Jewish prophecy, so he must have had some Jewish blood. Here he is described as being an Arab, a son, a man of the son of Ishmael, named Muhammad, a merchant. So this is a very, very well known nowadays um, source um, about Muhammad. What's interest, interesting here is that Muhammad teaches the Arab to into um, a kind of Jewish face. He taught, he teaches them a sort of Abrahamic uh, ascendance. And he said to them that God promised that country to Abraham. Obviously, it's not Mecca here. It's Canaan, it's Israel. God promised that country to Abraham and to his son after him, so Ishmael. Now, however, you are the son of Abraham through Ishmael. And so God shall fulfill the promise made to Abraham and his son on you, you the Arabs, the Christian Arabs. Only love the God of Abraham which means don't love Jesus as God, so uh, don't associate, and go and take the country which God gave to your father, Abraham. Which country? Mecca, the Hijaz, or Palestine, or um, Israel, Canaan. So there again, something to link the um, origins of Islam to um, a kind of Jewishness. But is it really Judaism? We will see. Uh, thereafter, the, we know that Jerusalem was taken by the Arab around 638, and they were guided by Jews. We have another source from 670 and an anonymous text in uh, the Pratum Spirituale of John Moscus, which said that when the Arabs came to Jerusalem, so when they took Jerusalem around 638, there were with them men from among the sons of Israel 
who showed them the location of the temple. Um, another strange thing, when <laughs> we see that the Jews were um, forbidden um, to, to enter Jerusalem under Christian rule, they shortly came back to Jerusalem between 6, 6 uh, 14 and 617. But thereafter, they were kind of expelled again, especially when the, the Christian took uh, Jerusalem back. But around 638, when the Arab took Jerusalem, Jews came back to Jerusalem with them. But they were expelled by the Arabs two, two years later. We see this in the Jewish traditions, uh, the history of Palestine by Moshe Gil. Gil. Uh, also something very strange. The Jews were friends with the Arabs at, at the time. They came with them to Jerusalem. And then those very same Arabs expelled them from Jerusalem. You see something of a coincidence with the Nazarenes we spoke about as being both friends and enemies of the believers. We will um, look at it in thereafter. We see also that Jerusalem played um, a crucial role uh, role, I forgot the word role, in the Islamic eschatology. Uh, Mel already told you about, uh, about this. <laughs> he took it from, uh, from me. Um, oh, he took it from Professor Guillaume D, a French scholar, very, very proficient scholar, and um, who was who's, um, a leading scholar in Quranic studies and we discovered that in some of the Islamic tradition, uh, Jerusalem is, um, is supposed to be the place of the last of the judgment day, uh, the place of um, gathering, there will be a gathering here in Jerusalem of the nation, gathering and resurrection of the dead will take place, take place in Jerusalem. And also there is something about the rock the rock, which is the summit of the Temple Mount, uh, which is now under the Dome of the Rock. This rock is supposed to be, in this tradition, the navel of the world. Uh, navel as being Sura in Arabic, which is the part that remains after the umbilical cord, Sur, has been cut. So we see that the, this exact um, location, this rock was supposed to be the link, the connection between the paradise, heaven, and earth. And this is the, the ultimate place. This is where, um, where the apocalypse is supposed to happen. Uh, we also saw in the previous presentation with Mel and with Paul, that the valley of the Kidron between Mount Moria and Mount Scopus was the place which was described by Prophet Joel as the place of the gathering of the nations for the judgment, the place, uh, the valley of decision. Uh, I've quoted Joel here, yes, in those days in that time, and I restored Judah and Jerusalem from captivity. I will gather all the nation bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision, the valley of Kidron. There I will enter in judgment against them concerning my people, my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nation as they divided up my land. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decisions. So there is something very um, eschatological, apocalyptical in Jerusalem, and the early Muslims were believing it also. Also, we see in the standard Islamic narrative uh, some very strange characters, such as Kab al Arbar, uh, which is described as being a former Jew who converted to Islam, maybe like Waraka bin Naufal, we don't know, is not named um, a Nazarene, but a former Jew who converted to Islam. But uh, even though he was a, a true Muslim, he wanted to build a synagogue on the Temple Mount, which is uh, very odd for a Muslim. A Muslim is supposed to build a mosque, not a synagogue. And also uh, a Jew uh, does not build uh, anything else at the Temple, on the Temple Mount. 
uh, why would he want to build a synagogue? Was he a rabbinical Jew or was he a Muslim? Again, something very hard here. And um, at last, I wanted to point out what I will develop now is some new Quranic studies about the biblical context and the Aramaic background of the Quran, uh, first thing. But second thing, and the most important, at what will we, we will see now, it is the, the new global exegesis that has been developed by Edouard Marigalet um, and, and many others before him, Antoine Moussali, uh, Youssef Dora Haddad, enfin, other Eastern Christians. And this global exegesis, you know, they, you know already a bit about it, Jay, because when you, you did the work about uh, Mecca and Jerusalem, this was all about a global exegesis, which means um, um, selectioning, um, lo looking at a particular expression, for example, Masjid al-Aram, looking at it in the Quranic text, um, looking at every occurrence, trying to, to make sense of those occurrences, comparing the senses between them, and in doing so, we get um, the literal sense of the, um, of the expression. So we did it for Masjid al-Aram, we did it with the, um, the forbidden um, place of worship, um, which is supposed to be the Haram in Mecca, according to the standard Islamic narrative, but we know now that it is the Temple Mount, the forbidden place of worship, because Jerusalem was forbidden to Jewish people at this time, and the Hajj could not be performed there. And uh, you've seen this also for the, for example, for the Beit, the house, the temple, which also pertains to Jerusalem and not to Mecca. And so we, we saw we saw here that the standard Islamic narrative, the Islamic reading of the Quran, is being very seriously challenged by new discoveries, by obvious thing, logical things, um, just like we saw. And especially in particular, we see that those new discoveries tend to point at the influence of a Jewish group or people being described as Jewish. And those people might have had a very decisive influence at the beginnings of Islam. But what we have here now uh, is only um, mostly uh, external sources, Doctrina Jacobi and so on, a critical uh, approach of the standard Islamic narrative, but in itself, it's not enough to, to know what is this Jewish group. We have to go uh, into the Quran, to, we have to take a deep dive into the Quran and to, and to look into the um, people of the book. Who are the people of the book? We will see that there are good people of the book, bad people of the book. There are coverers, kufas among the people of the group. The Nazarenes are part of the people of the book and they were very close to the believers. And so we will see this, I guess, in, a, in another presentation. Well, listen, thanks so much. This has been good for you to give a quick overview leading up. This will be the first episode. We're going to move into another episode where you're actually going to start unpacking the Quran, which will be a good introduction to that huge corpus of material. Now, what's interesting is we've had Joe give his viewpoint from a Jewish standpoint. We've had Mel give his point, his viewpoint from a historical standpoint. You're coming in from a French standpoint and you're using French scholars, <laughs> Edouard Marie Galez. We've never heard of this guy before. And what you're doing, in some ways, are devoid of each other, we're coming to the same conclusions. Have you noticed this? You down in France and we up in Britain and also here in the United States, we're all, all going back to the same artifacts, the same material, and we're finding that there is a problem, there a problem with the standard Islamic narrative from the ninth century because mm -hmm. they're assuming that all these characters and all these people and all these events are happening in the middle part of Arabia, you showed the maps there, that cannot be. They either happened down in the Himyar area, what is today Yemen, or they happened in Jerusalem. And so much of what the standard Islamic narrative uh, 
took away from Jerusalem and tried to replace it, transport it, and transfer it down to Mecca and Medina are now coming to naught. That's why it's so good to have your viewpoint and our viewpoint coinciding together to show the standard Islamic narrative is full of holes. One more big hold. And so that's why it's so good now. And then we're going to move into the Quran. Keep your pipe going. Keep it nice and hot because we're going to come right back. It's good to have you here, Odon. And it's good to now Thank you, Jay. Let's open up the Quran and let's see what we can find. This is Jay here in the United States and Odon there in France. Over and out. Uh -huh.